Hey guys. I'm gonna keep on trucking with Night of the Twisters. I hope you guys are liking it. I told you that the eight o'clock hour had a lot more action in it. And so did the nine o'clock hour. So let's look back on the nine o'clock hour. So the tornado has come through. Dan ended up making it into Ryan's room just as the lights went out and Ryan his baby brother was all caught up in the mobile, little mobile that goes over his crib to kind of calm him down. So he was all caught up in that. And he, he's scared. Like he's, he's actually really feeling very, very scared, not knowing where anybody is. <clears throat> so he makes it down the stairs with Ryan. And the boys get downstairs into the bathroom and they hear things moving around upstairs and Arthur's like, oh, look, your mom's home. Let's go, let's go talk to her. And Dan knows that's not mom upstairs. He knows that that is the tornado that is pushing and moving everything in the house around upstairs. So they get under a towel or under the blanket, try to protect themselves as best they can. Um, then they, uh, Dan hears his dad's voice in his head and it's saying the shower is the safest place. If there's ever a tornado, you need to get in the shower, the shower is the safest place. So Dan gets Ryan and drags Arthur and they all get in the shower and they're huddled together under the blanket and Ryan, the baby brother, ends up finding Dan's hand and just kind of clutching onto his fingers and Dan felt really close and really connected to Ryan at the time and it was like it was almost like Ryan was trying to make Dan feel better. He knew that he was scared and trying to make one another feel better. So that was nice. Then they were in there in the shower still, and it says afterward, neither Arthur nor I was able to say how long we huddled there in that basement shower. So they were there in the shower for a really long time, what it felt like to them for a really long time. And it says a tornado's forward speed is generally 30 to 50 miles an hour. The meteorologists had told them our tornado's forward speed was zero. It parked itself right there on Sand Crane Drive. It felt like forever to them that that tornado was just over them, moving everything around and destroying everything. So then after the tornado, that part of it passed, the hail started and Arthur ended up getting sick and vomiting everywhere just because he's scared. Then everybody starts worrying about every, oh, everybody else. Dan starts worrying about mom and what happened to her. Arthur's worrying about his mom saying she would never go into the, into the basement. She doesn't do this the right way and he's concerned and everybody's worried. So it's really about the end of it. They are there in the shower. They're looking up into the rain. So what used to be the house above them is now just the sky. And they're just looking up like this, blinking as the rain is falling onto them. So this one is not called 10 o'clock hour. This is called the next hour or so. We were soaking wet and getting colder by the minute. Already water had risen two or three inches in the shower. I knew we can stay there much longer. Ryan needed dry clothes and I had to find mom. Listen, Arthur said, now that things had quieted a little. Do you hear water running? I'd been hearing it, water gurgling and splashing onto the cement floor. Pipes are broken, he said. Let's go, I said, through chattering teeth, though I didn't have any idea where we were going. Arthur got out ahead of me, carefully picking his way across the bathroom rubble. He held up something shiny, our towel rack, bent like a boomerang. With that, he dug among chunks of sheetrock for the flashlight, which miraculously was still on. Want me to check around first, he asked. No, 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 wait, I'm coming. I got stiffly to my feet and shifted Ryan so that he wouldn't brush against the jagged edge of the shower door. If the stairs are clear, we can walk right up on like always. Ryan patted my face. He was so glad to be up and moving just like I was. The first shock was Arthur's because he had the flashlight. When I pushed into the doorway beside him, I caught my breath. Our house was gone. Roof, walls, floor, gone. As far as I could see, only the cement foundation remained. Inside the foundation, 
surrounding us and blocking our way was a jungle of fallen support beams and splintered wood. I figured the rec room and the big storage area were just as bad. Pick up sticks, Arthur said quietly. I couldn't speak. I just stood there, letting the horrible truth soak in. Our furniture, our clothes, books were haphazardly mixed into the wreckage. Papers were scattered everywhere. Like white bats, they flung up and over the foundation in this gusting wind. A tangle of two by fours barricaded us into the bathroom. Arthur stepped over a paint can and kicked aside a striped towel that I'd never actually seen before. In a half string of voice, he said, you can't bring Ryan out of here. Well, I can't leave him in the bathroom by himself. I couldn't stay behind. Didn't Arthur know that? I was scared. I had to get out and find my mom. He didn't argue when I followed him. Besides, he needed my help to open up the even the skinniest passage alongside the bathroom wall. With Ryan on my left arm, my right one was free to help Arthur twist aside the boards. The loose stuff we threw over the partition in the direction of the storage area. We hadn't cleared three feet toward the stairs before we knew we'd gone as far as we could go in that direction. Dad's rocker lounger was wedged into the basement hallway ahead of us, buried under a ton of stuff. Somebody's camper shell rested on top of it all. I can't budge it, Arthur groaned after several tries at moving the camper top. I slumped against the wall, totally discouraged. The stairs are buried too, I said. They'd have to be. Arthur climbed up onto the arm of Dan, a Dad's chair. He covered the West Foundation from one end to the other with the flashlight. Gosh, Dan, look at that! Outlined against the black sky, the northwest corner of our house, the only ones still actually attached, sagged freakishly toward each other. I thought of skin flaps curling over a womb. It made me sick to look at it. Ryan's room, I said. The bunny wallpaper. As much as I wanted my mom and dad right then, I was glad they weren't there to see all I was seeing. They loved our house just as much as I did. Ryan shivered and drew up his knees. Suddenly, I had an idea. Arthur, could we climb out over that pile of bricks on the other side? He shone the light onto the avalanche of buff colored bricks along the west wall. Well, how do we get there? Just then, a low moaning sound raised hackles on the back of my neck. Arthur jumped out off the chair. We froze. The noise rumbled to a crescendo right over our heads, making us jump when it crashed. Thunder. My Lord, it was only thunder. Take Ryan a minute, I said, recovering enough to trade him for the flashlight. I'll be right back. I left them at the bathroom door and snaked my way along the hallway heading north, ducking and burying under debris when I had to. If I could just get to that brick pile. Glass crunched underfoot with every step and I kept getting snagged by things I couldn't see. Once I fell and dropped a flashlight in the water, I scraped myself good trying to get to it again. The biggest hurdle was a massive wet carpeting, gold shag from our living room, or maybe the upstairs hall. I pushed against it. It was too soggy, too heavy. I'd have to crawl over it. Ow, ouch, ouch, I cried as something gouged me in the leg. Are you okay, Arthur yelled. I'm okay, I answered back. Glad he couldn't see my face. My jeans were ripped and I was bleeding, but the wound wasn't mortal, as Arthur would say. I kicked viciously at the board with the ugly nails sticking out. How in the world would we get Ryan out without hurting him? The basement was a stupid obstacle course, a death trap. I stood there a minute, breathing hard, wondering what to do next. It was raining again and I was shaking from the cold, from being so scared, the top of my hand stung with scrapes and blood trickled down my leg. Were we trapped? Of course, there was always the bathroom standing on the toilet on the outside wall. We could probably help each other out, but then what about Ryan? Could we hoist him up or something? And in the lightning that tore across the sky every few minutes, I could see the clouds were still low and boiling. I didn't know if we'd be safe anywhere, even if we got out. I wanted my mom and dad so much. And I wanted Minerva. I swung the light around, probing the dark recesses for two bright eyes. I shot the beam higher up, remembering how she hated water. Here, kitty, I whispered. I tried using my high kitty calling voice, but my throat closed off. In my heart, I knew it was no use. She was gone. No way could a lightweight like Minerva survive a tornado. I slid down on my heels, pushing my face into the wet carpet. 
I don't know what to do. Hot tears squeezed out of my eyes. What in the world was I supposed to do? From somewhere came the wail of sirens, dipping in and out of the wind. At first, the sound made me feel worse than ever. Death. Fire. God help us. Then my head jerked up. Sirens! That meant there were people alive out there. Someone was coming to help. Were the police cars? Were the ambulances? I cannot give up now. Dan, what are you doing? Arthur called, and I remembered it left him in the dark. I think I can smell gas. <sighs> I straightened and sniffed. My nose was too clogged up. I couldn't smell anything. I sniffed again. With gas escaping, we could have an explosion. We could be gassed just by breathing. Whirling around, I snagged my other leg, but I didn't stop. I just went crashing back to where Arthur and Ryan were waiting. We can't get through, I said, with fresh panic. Can you smell gas? I can't tell, but there will be gas leaking out if water is, right? Ryan was stiffening and throwing his head back, going, ah! The crying would start any minute. He's blue, Arthur said, jousting him up and down. Can't we find something dry to wrap him in? That, on top of everything else. My mind was thrashing so bad I couldn't think straight. Wah! Ryan cried. All of a sudden, I remembered the stack of towels Mom kept under the sink. I could wrap him in one of those. I pushed Arthur, knelt, wrenched the cupboard open enough to reach one hand in and pulled out a towel. It's dry, I yelled, thrilled to have something go right. We couldn't lay Ryan down on the countertops, which was covered with broken mirror, so Arthur sat on the toilet seat and held him. I left his undershirt on, but worked up, worked his wet diaper off over his hips. Then with Arthur's help, I got the towel around him twice. I held him close, rocking and shushing him the way I'd seen mom do it. He snuggled into my chest. He didn't know it, but he was warming me just as much as I was warming him. In the meantime, Arthur was doing the thinking for all of us. Hey, hey, I have an idea, he said. I never got to hear what it was because just then a tight, a light appeared overhead, bobbing up and down with someone's footsteps. Coming closer, the light swept over our heads across the West Foundation onto the sagging walls. Help, Arthur yelled at once, too close to Ryan's ear, and the baby screamed. We're down here, he yelled again. Arthur, dear God, is that you? Hope shot through me like an electric charge. Arthur was jumping up and down. Mama? No, it's me, Stacy. Arthur shot the light straight up in the sky, waving it around like a beacon. Seconds later, remember Stacy is his sister, older sister. Seconds later, Stacy was looking down on us from above and we were lighting up each other's faces, which didn't need lighting up at all. We would have glowed in the dark. We were all so happy to see one another. Where's mama? Is she okay? What about? Everyone's okay, now that I've found you. For the first time, Arthur burst into tears. Big sobs racked his body. He couldn't have held them back if he tried. We were so worried, Stacy said, half sobbing herself. We tried to get you on the phone before. I thought you were all dead, Arthur gulped. I didn't think you'd go downstairs. Oh, Arthur, we didn't. There wasn't time. Mama tried to get everyone under the big bed, but she and Ronnie and I wouldn't fit. We had to flatten out on the floor. It was awful. We were lying there holding onto each other. Arthur, Ronnie Bay got sucked right out of the window. I gasped. I tried to hang on to her, but I couldn't. I couldn't do anything but scream. Stacy, is she all right? She is, it's a pure miracle. It threw her into the wine guard's bushes, and knocked her out. Stacy wiped her face, her hand shaking so hard we could see it from below. Mama thinks she doesn't even actually remember it. I shuddered. I could feel that sucking tornado all over again, and I could see Ronnie. Ryan let out a first-class wail about them that sent us all into action. Stacy leaned over the foundation and spotted the toilet tank with her big flashlight. Listen, Dan, she said, gulping hard. Can you climb up on that, John, with Ryan? I nodded. In a second, she was straddling the foundation, the torch positioned on the cement in front of her. The wind tossed the rain into her faces and sent her black hair flying as I scrambled onto the toilet seat. Hand the baby to me first, then I'll help you guys up, she said. I climbed onto the narrow toilet tank, bracing myself against the wall with Stacy hold on, holding on to the neck of my shirt. I managed to take Ryan when Arthur lifted him to me. I had to grab hold of Stacy's leg once to keep from toppling over, but we got the job done. Right away, she rewrapped him. Poor little guy, she crooned. He's practically naked, isn't he? A few minutes later, Arthur and I were climbing over all of this stuff in the laundry room with Stacy directing us. 
The window there had blown out clean to, as a whistle, frame and all, and the washing machine gave us something to stand on. In no time, we were at ground level, shining our lights over all the unbelievable rubble. Our yard looked like a World War II battlefield. Next to the flattened garage, Dad's prized white Corvette lay on its top like a discarded matchbox toy. Somewhere under the, heap, the trash heap I knew was my bike, my beloved tin racers. When I saw our big maple tree uprooted and stripped clean, lying on the ground, it really hit me. Hooked on one branch was a scrap of lavender cloth. I guess seeing the top half of grandma's birthday dress snapping and twisting in the wind made me sadder than anything. It was like, well, like seeing unfinished dreams, I guess. The whole neighborhood is gone, Stacy said, flashing onto the scrambled walls of the house next door, then onto a section of roof lying across the driveway. Wreckage was scattered in every direction, as far as we could see. Stacy handed me the torch so she could snap, snap her dad's jacket around Ryan. Stacy, I have to find my mom, I blurted out suddenly. What do you mean? Don't you know where she is? I thought you were home alone, tending Ryan. I could feel the corners of my mouth pulling down. I turned away so that Arthur could tell her for me. When he finished, he asked Stacy if she could go take Ryan to her house so the two of us could go look for mom. Arthur, she exclaimed, we don't have a house anymore. His jaw dropped. We don't? All that's left is a few walls. The whole neighborhood looks like this. Now it was Arthur's turn to be speechless. I know how sick it sounds, but somehow hearing such bad news made me feel better. We were all in the same boat. We were all homeless. Slowly we began picking our way toward the street. Where's Mama now? Arthur asked. Patrol cars down at the end of the block right after the, after the tornado loading people up. We took the kids down there. I begged her to let me come to dance and look for you. She said if I found you, we should get out fast. Any way we could. It's too dangerous to stay here. I stopped right in front of her. I am not leaving without my mom. Of course not, Dan. We'll find her, you'll see. But then Stacy had her arm around me, giving me a squeeze that made me want to cry all over again. I'll bet she's waiting at the store I'm at Smiley's right now. A blast of wind plastered my wet clothes to my body, triggering a bad case of the shakes. I prayed to God that she was all right. Once we got to the street, we took off running, or well, trying to run. Arthur and I were in front. Stacy was right behind. With Ryan in his Levi's pouch, there was no time to think about what we might find between our house and the smi and Smiley's. We just went. Covering those three blocks was like reliving my worst nightmare. It must have taken us 20 minutes to get to the corner of Sand Crane Drive and Fonda Way, a distance I've clocked at one minute, three seconds on my bike, two minutes, four seconds if I'm running. Remember those dreams where you're frantically trying to get away from someone and you can't move? In mine, it's always these great hulking linebackers in big black jumpsuits who all tackle me at once. They won't let go of my legs, so I have to keep dragging them along. I'm yelling and screaming the whole time, but nobody ever comes to save me. Finally, I wake up in a sweat just as they're ready to bash my brains out. That night, rain soaked, shaken by thunder that rolled across the sky like kettle drums. I kept telling myself this was only another nightmare. Pretty soon, I'd wake up and laugh because none of it was true, but I knew I was feeding myself a lie. The truth was just too terrible, that's all. Everything on Sand Crane Drive was destroyed, and getting to Smiley's place fast was exactly like trying to escape a bad dream. All structures, houses, garages, fences, telephone poles had been leveled. The debris scattered, helter skelter. The only buildings still standing were a line of apartments several blocks away that we could see when lightning flashed. The trees on Sand Crane Drive were straight out of a nightmare too. They looked as if some giant with a big meaty hand had stripped them of their main branches and snapped off the rest. A few of the big trees had toppled clean over. Their shaggy root system silhouetted against that electric sky looked like a landscape from a, mo a monster movie. There was no sign of mom anywhere or her silver Chevy citation. Cars and trucks had been tossed about like toys up and down Sand Crane Drive, but hers wasn't one of them. We went a long time without stopping, stumbling, ducking things that were blowing loose. I fell a couple of times. We were so intent on sweeping both sides of the street with our lights, we sometimes crashed into each other in the dark. Mom, mom, I tried yelling at first, but the wind just shredded my words. She would never hear me over that howling, spitting storm. Once my heart leaped, I thought I saw her. 
and someone thin wearing jeans hanging on the back door of a van. When a man and a boy appeared, I recognized Jason Miller from school and I knew the lady wasn't my mom, but his. They shone their light at us and Jason's dad yelled, who is it? We slowed and answered back. Have you seen my mom? I shouted. They looked at each other and shook their heads. Closer now, we could see they were inspecting their Miller's plumbing van that had been slammed against a tree in their side yard. Jason, shirt tail flopping, appeared stunned at the sight of us running by. Until Stacy got hit in the face with what we thought was a flying shingle, we hardly stopped at all. But then we had to. We made her sit down on the curb so Arthur could inspect the welt rising on her cheek. But Stacy only pushed him away. I'm okay, you guys, really, she insisted, though she was blinking very hard. I knew it was hurting. I can take Ryan, I offered, as I gulped in the air. Do you want me to? No, 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 he's fine, Stacy said as she hooked her hair behind her ears, sniffling a little, then awkwardly got to her feet. She hitched the baby up in place again. Look, Dan, she said, just look at him. I shone the light so I could see Ryan peeking out from inside of his jacket. He looked up at me all bright-eyed and solemn, and I had to smile at him. Isn't he something? I think he actually likes this ride, Stacy said with a grin. And then we were off again. When Arthur yelled a little later, a person could get lost. I knew what he meant. Without familiar landmarks, we'd long since lost track of who lived where. At last, we reached the corner of Fonda Way and Sand Crane Drive, only to find the intersection there strewn with litter of Aunt Goldie's house. All she had left at the, was the bottom half of her yellow split level. Not even that. Part of the lower level had been shared off too. Maybe Goldie had left out, not being home when it happened. I had to remind myself that none of us had left out. Not that night. My heart was pounding hard as I leaped over the splintering wood covering Goldie's front yard. I had stopped being careful by then and was yelling for mom once more. I couldn't get that picture out of my mind. Her flying through the air. She could be buried anywhere. How would we know? Arthur trailed me, both of us leaving Stacy behind. Then I saw mom's car. My heart quit beating altogether. It was next door to Goldie's in Miss Stevens' yard, a battered wreck wrapped in a length of chain link fence. Mom, I screamed, clambering over everything to get to it. My hand shook wildly and as I shone the light inside, over the back seat and across the floor. It was empty, her purse lay on the front seat covered with broken glass. Mom, Mom, I cried, but the wind whipped the words out of my mouth and frantically I started hauling stuff out from under the car. Boards, bricks, chunks of siding, throwing them anywhere, digging and crying until I couldn't see. I had to find her. She could be trapped, she could be dying. Arthur grabbed my arm from behind. Come on, Dan, he yelled. She made it to Smiley's. I know she did. I shook him off. I had to find her. Then the two of them got hold of me and pulled me away from the car. I kicked at Stacy, swore at Arthur, but they wouldn't let me go. Arthur wrestled the light out of my hand, dragged me along beside him. I knew she was there, buried under the car. I knew it. I didn't want to go to Smiley's and waste all that time, but they wouldn't let go. I was so crazy right then. I didn't see the person in the red windbreaker who was hurrying towards us. Look, Stacy and Arthur shouted together. And then it was my mom's voice. Danny, Danny! Seconds later, I was in my mother's arms, crying like a baby. Arthur and Stacy were crying too, but mom and I were the ones making the most noise. You can't imagine how I felt right then. We all had our arms around each other next. Mom was kissing everybody, including Ryan, right through the denim jacket. I figured then that nothing else mattered. You can do without all things, your house, bike, your room, a whole city of people if you have the ones that you love. Stacy, Arthur, and I got into each other's way, trying to explain what it was like at our place and the Darlingtons all over Grand Island for all we knew. We snuffled and wiped our faces on our sleeves. Even mom then smiled through our tears and hugged some more. It was really something. All right, guys, that is not the end of this chapter, but it's a long one and we've got kids coming back in the room. So I will finish this up in just a minute.